Hello, welcome to Traditional Chinese Medicine, an introduction to diagnostics and theory. My name is Christina Kabothanasis. I am a licensed acupuncturist here in Hawaii, and I am the executive director of the Hawaii Oriental Medicine and Acupuncture Association. I will be your host today. We're going to be talking a little bit about traditional Chinese medicine, diagnostic theory, and the diagnostic methods we use. Chinese medicine has a history of over 3,000 years. And over those 3,000 years, it has evolved into a complete medical system. Even though modern practitioners study both Western medicine and Chinese medicine and use them complementary, some of the texts that were written in the times of BC are still very applicable today. So why don't we take a look at traditional Chinese medicine and what it comprises. When you think of traditional Chinese medicine, what comes to mind? Most people would say acupuncture, or the insertion of fine stainless steel needles into specific points around the body. But you should also think of herbal medicine and lifestyle changes, such as Chinese nutrition and Chinese exercise. We'll take a little look at herbs. Herbal medicine is comprised of mostly plant origin herbs. These can include things like roots, twigs, leaves, stems, flowers, and seeds. But some herbs also are from mineral or animal origin. Herbs have different thermal properties, such as warm, neutral, or cooling. They also have different tastes, such as sweet, sour, bitter, or salty. They also have affinities for different organs, such as your lungs, heart, liver, gallbladder, digestive organs, and kidneys. In addition, they have specific functions, and one herb can have more than one function. For example, they may clear heat from the body, or transform phlegm and dampness. They may boost your chi, or the energy in the body, or boost specific organs like lungs or kidneys. Acupuncture is not just the insertion of needles into the body, but we use several different therapeutic means to stimulate these points called acupuncture points. In addition to needles, we use things like cupping, moxibustion, laser acupuncture, electric acupuncture, and a kind of massage called tuena, or acupressure. Lifestyle changes are also a very important part of traditional Chinese medicine. As everybody knows, diet and exercise play major factors in influencing your health. Chinese nutrition goes hand in hand with herbal medicine because some herbs are used in everyday cooking and some foods are classified as herbs. Just as herbs, foods have different thermal properties. For example, a banana is cooling, where a mango is damp and hot. They have different flavors, sweet, stringent, bitter, sour, and they also have different qualities, moisturing the lungs, promoting digestion, etc. Lastly, we have Chinese exercise. Qi Gong and Tai Chi Quan are two common forms of Chinese exercise. Tai Chi Quan focuses on moving the energy in the body and making it flow property, properly to restore health. Qi Gong is also another form of exercise that focuses on building the vital energy or Qi in your lower abdomen in the place called Dan Tian. And these two types of exercise coupled with nutrition and herbal medicine and acupuncture complete the picture of traditional Chinese medicine. Now that we have a look at what Chinese medicine consists of, let's take a look at our main diagnostic principles. In Chinese, those are Wang, Wen, Wen, Qie. These couple with Western medicine and have a lot of places where they are the same. But we are looking for different clues to what's going on in the body when we use these four diagnostic principles. The first one is inspection. Inspection just means we are looking at 
the body. We're looking at the size and shape of the body. We're looking at the position of the body. We look at the face and the different colors and shapes of the face. And most importantly, we look at the tongue. There, in Chinese medicine, we have something called tongue diagnosis. And this is very special to Chinese medicine. We look at the color and the size and the shape of the tongue and the coating to tell us about the different organs, qi and blood, and the conditions of all of those. Next, we will listen and smell. Listen. We will listen to the sound of the voice and the powerfulness of the voice or the weakness of the voice. We may listen to things like the cough, if the cough is productive or not. We may also ask the patient to tell us about the smell of body excretions. All these things give us more clues to the diagnosis in terms of Chinese medicine. The most important principle of diagnosis is inquire. Inquiry is just asking the patient history. We ask a detailed series of questions covering your head all the way to your toes. And we are looking for different answers than that of a Western medical practitioner. This is definitely the most important part of the diagnostic process and generally in Chinese medicine this can take up to a half an hour in your initial visit. Last, we look at palpitation. Palpation. Palpation is just touching the body. We may palpat, palpate the abdomen if there's tenderness in the abdomen or a joint that is having pain or stiffness. And important, most importantly in palpation is pulse diagnosis. Pulse diagnosis is another very special part of Chinese medical diagnosis. Because in the pulse diagnosis, we will look for signs of the health of your qi or your energy level, the blood, and all the specific organs. We take the pulse as a whole, and we take the pulse separately. All these diagnostic principles coupled together give us a complete picture at what's going on inside the body. So that takes us to the actual diagnostic theory. What are we looking for when we look at the pulse and take the, take the tongue diagnosis and ask these kind of questions? In Chinese medicine, we have two levels of diagnosis. The first level is very similar to Western diagnosis. If you come in and are having problems sleeping, we might say you have insomnia. If you are having trouble going to the bathroom, we might say you have constipation. In Chinese medicine, our specialty is taking this first level of diagnosis and subclassifying it into something we call syndrome differentiation. That just means that there are several types of insomnia and several types of infertility and several types of joint pain. Today we're going to take the example of stomach pain. If a patient comes in and has stomach pain, we will do a complete diagnosis. And at the end of that diagnosis, we might come up with the answer, you have deficiency cold in your spleen and stomach. This is when communication usually starts to break down between the patient and the practitioner, or the Western medical practitioner and the Eastern medicine practitioner. So what we need to do is learn some basic vocabulary to help you understand how to communicate with the TCM practitioner. Today, today I prepared a okay, today I prepared a small graph of the qualities we use to diagnose illness. In the center of the screen you can see the yin and yang symbol. This is a symbol that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. This symbol actually represents two sets of opposing qualities. The black side represents yin and the white side represents yang. The white dot in the black side and the black dot in the white side represents the idea that they are inseparable and they are rooted in each other. The shift from the small part of black expanding into a wider part of black and then transforming into white signifies the relationship between yin and yang. 
They are constantly changing and there is no static balance between the two. Now in terms of the qualities of yin and yang, I have chosen two pictures to represent these qualities. On the left is a night scene. The qualities of yin are night, cold, calming, and nourishing, the quality of nourishing fluids. On the other side is a bright day at the Waikiki. This is a sign, these have the qualities of daytime, heat, activity, and motion. So these are the opposing qualities that we use to classify all disease in Chinese medicine. And we pick out the basic qualities of cold and heat, deficiency or not having enough of something, and excess or having too much of something, and internal versus external. For our purposes today, we aren't going to focus on internal or external because most diseases are classified as internal. If we stick with cold and heat, deficiency and excess, we can pair these ideas together in four different sin patterns of imbalance. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see a little graph. The gray bars represent or the nourishing, cooling, moisturizing qualities of water, and the red bars represent the active, hot qualities of the sun. The first example, they are in balance. Yin and yang are equal, and the body has no symptom or signs of pain. The person is healthy. In the second example, you see the red bar is higher than the gray bar. This is called excess of heat. And to give you a very simple explanation, we'll talk about the example of someone who went to have a very spicy Mexican dinner. Maybe they had a little bit too many jalapenos and hot sauce on their burrito, and now their stomach is on fire, they are very thirsty, they have a red face, they may be flush, and they may be sweating. This is a very simple example to express the idea of excess or having too much heat in the body. On the other hand, if we look at the third example, is excess of cold. If that same person went and had two or three bowls of ice cream or several glasses of cold, ice cold drinks, they may feel stomach cramping or they may feel cold down to their bones and shiver. This is an idea of having too much or excess cold in the body. The last two are deficiency heat and deficiency cold. In deficiency heat, as you can see, the red bar or the yang part of the body is actually in balance. But the yin or the gray bar is too low. There is too little nourishing quality of the yin in the body. So this may be seen in somebody who has worked all day without having any water. The idea of dehydration. They have a dry mouth. They may feel a little flush. And women going through menopause having sudden bursts of hot flashes or sweating at night is another example of deficiency or not having enough heat. Or not having enough fluid which appears as a kind of heat. Excuse me. Deficiency cold, on the other hand, is not having enough warmth in the body. So if that same person went all day without eating, at the beginning they would feel hungry, then they would feel tired, and eventually if they kept going, they would feel a kind of cold sensation. We call this deficiency cold. There is not enough warmth in the body to heat it up. Now you know the very, very basics of the Chinese medicine diagnostic principles. Cold and heat, deficiency and excess. But unfortunately, diagnosing all illnesses is not as simple as those four. We can couple words like the organs, the different organs, lungs, heart, liver, gallbladder, spleen, stomach, large and small intestines, kidneys and bladder, and couple that with the cold and heat or deficiency in excess to come up with several more patterns. For example, the lungs may have deficiency heat. The intestines may have excess heat. 
the kidneys may have deficiency cold, and so on. We can also add the word chi to those four patterns. For example, you can have chi deficiency, or we can think of that as having low energy levels. The blood can be deficient, the blood can have heat in it. So adding the different organ names, a coupling words like the chi or the energy in your body and blood really expands the variation of Gnostic names. The last two words that I'll talk about today are stagnation and dampness. Stagnation and dampness are two very important ideas in Chinese medicine. Stagnation is the idea of a stagnant pool of water. The water is not moving. Things in the body that can be stagnant are the qi. The energy is not moving or flowing properly in the body. The blood can also be stagnant. You can think of poor circulation or food that is sitting in the digestive system not being properly metabolized can also be a kind of stagnation. Dampness is the other important topic, the last topic of this vocabulary of Chinese medicine. And dampness is a kind of stickiness in the body. Stickiness in terms of the water metabolism is not in balance in the body. For example, if you have a cold, the phlegm that you cough up is a kind of dampness. For those who are overweight, the excess weight on the body is another clinical manifestation of dampness. So now you have the very basic vocabulary to describe the different diagnosis for different illness in the body. Let's come back to the example we used at the beginning with stomach pain. So if you come in and you have stomach pain, there are at least seven different kinds of syndromes or patterns that we can describe this, the stomach pain as. Number one says excess cold in the stomach. So this person may have been the one that had too many ice cold drinks or too much ice cream and they're having cramping pains in the stomach. Food stagnation is the person who maybe overindulged on rich, heavy foods, sweet or alcohol, and they are having trouble digesting all that they've eaten. The third says liver attacking the stomach. A very common case of liver attacking the stomach is a person who is under a lot of stress or who is, who is nervous. We hold stress in our liver. We say that the chi is stagnant or is not flowing properly through the liver. And when this chi, liver chi is stagnant, it can come and attack the stomach. You can see things like stomach pain or diarrhea. So for the person who is, has a fear of flying, before they get ready to go take their flight, they may have mild stomach pain or mild diarrhea. This is a very typical example of liver attacking the spleen, attacking the stomach. Another example would be damp, heat obstructing the middle. The idea of dampness coupled with heat leaving the digestive system. And in the Western diet, with our heavy reliance on wheat, dairy, and meat, damp heat is rampant in the West. Blood stagnation is seen more in the chronic, chronic conditions of long-term pain and sort of like a stabbing pain in the stomach. Whereas the next one, stom stomach yin deficiency, is seen as a deficiency or lacking of fluids in the stomach. So a very typical example would be someone with diabetes who is hungry all the time. If they're hungry all the time and they feel a little bit emptiness or warm feeling in the stomach, we call that this is some kind of yin deficiency in the stomach. And last, we come back to the example that I used in the beginning. Spleen and stomach deficiency cold. People are usually thin, have low energy, and may have loose bowels. Now what I would like you to understand with this example is that there are several different kinds of stomach pain. There are several different kinds of insomnia, constipation, infertility, joint pain, etc. And for all of these different kinds of syndromes, you will receive a different treatment plan. 
For the person with excess cold in the stomach, they will receive different herbal formulas or acupuncture points than a person with damp heat obstructing the middle. And And for the same two people with excess cold in the stomach, they may have completely different constitutions. When we say congestion, we mean your body type or the tendency that your body usually has in terms of the heat and the cold and the deficiency and the excess. So two people that come in with excess cold in the stomach patterns may also have slightly different formulas because Chinese medicine is working at the very individual level. Each person's prescription is completely different. Last, I'd like to talk a little bit about what acupuncture or herbal medicine can treat. Herbal medicine and acupuncture can help you in any of your systems. If we start with the lungs, herbal medicine can help with a common cold, coughs or chronic coughing, or asthma. In the digestive system, you can see nausea, vomiting, allergies. Most allergies are rooted in the digestive system, imbalances in the digestive system, stomach pains, constipation, or diarrhea. And all of these kinds of illnesses have different subclassifications or different patterns. For the heart, palpitations, chest or rib pain, and insomnia, depression or anxiety are also treatable with Chinese medicine. In Chinese medicine, we say that the heart controls the mind and the spirit. So that is why we consider insomnia, depression, or anxiety as belonging to imbalances in the heart. And insomnia is usually caused by some kind of excess or deficiency heat in the system. But it may also be caused by deficiency in heart and spleen. It may be caused by excess in the stomach. This is just another example of how we subclassify diseases in Chinese medicine. In red are some of the most common known symptoms or conditions that acupuncture and herbal medicine can help. Facial paralysis and post-stroke symptoms are two very common things treated with Chinese medicine. Post-stroke symptoms may include half of the body after a stroke having decreased mobility or paralysis. And if patients can come in soon after a stroke, there's a very high percentage of full recovery rates. Headaches and migraines are all also very effectively helped with Chinese medicine. Dizziness, edema or swelling, urinary tract infections, and systemic problems like high blood pressure and diabetes, which coupled with Western medicine can be kept under control quite effectively. Joint pain and lower back pain are probably the most common treated conditions in the West because so much Western medicine research has been done on these conditions with the treatment of acupuncture. But gynecology, which is my specialty, is also very famous in Chinese medicine, treating female and male inf infertility, menstrual irregularities like cycle irregularities or bleeding irregularities, premenst premenstrual syndrome or menopausal symptoms are also helped with Chinese medicine. Nausea during pregnancy, cancer therapy side effects, for example those going through um, chemotherapy or radiation who have nausea or diarrhea, Chinese medicine may be helpful in relieving those side effects. Post-operative recovery, alopecia, baldness, and chronic conditions such as fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. The pain and fatigue associated with these syndromes can be aided or controlled by Chinese medicine. Weakened immune system for those who would like to quit smoking or lose weight, even cosmetic treatments like wrinkle treatments. We have something called a facelift with acupuncture. And these are some of the things that traditional Chinese medicine can treat. 
but by no means is this list all-inclusive. Preventative care is the last on the list, and it is very special because Chinese medicine can sometimes recognize conditions before you see obvious illness arise. You may have some symptoms that you don't realize are symptoms, and in Chinese medicine, we can help you see the imbalances in your body and bring those back into balance before into more serious problems. That concludes our discussion on diagnosis and diagnostic theory. Thank you so much for joining us. Next time we will be focusing a little bit more in depth on tongue diagnosis, pulse diagnosis, and the initial patient history taking. We're going to talk a little bit about what we look at when we're looking at the tongue, what we're feeling for when we take the pulse, and why we ask the detailed series of questions that we ask. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any other questions about acupuncture, herbal medicine, Chinese nutrition, or Chinese exercise, or any questions about the association, Hawaii Oriental Medicine and Acupuncture Association, please contact me at the phone number shown on the screen or with the email shown at the end of the... Bye-bye.